I'm Christopher Hahn, and I'll be serving as a moderator today. Uh, I'm joined by five panelists. Amy Ogan, Ken Kittinger, Suin Lee, Steve Ritter, and Yaro Zupko. I would like to ask each panelist to briefly say hello and introduce themselves. Starting with Amy. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Ogan. I'm at Carnegie Mellon University as the Thomas and Lydia Moran Professor of Learning Science. And my department is in human computer interaction. So my interest in AI and ed products uh, is around the design and study of AI and ed systems and how they might be best placed in both high infrastructure contexts, but also low infrastructure contexts. I'm thinking about how to make these products simple and easy for students, uh, teachers, and parents to use. And Ken? Hi, I'm also at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm the Hillman Professor of Computer Science here, and uh, I bring an interdisciplinary background. I was originally uh, trained in computer science and, and mathematics, and then switched to cognitive psychology. And I have been very interested in bringing those two together to use the psychology to understand the amazing uh, mystery of human learning and it's all its richness and complexity. And then use that understanding in AI in innovations to help improve education. And so in. Hi, my name is Suin Lee. I'm CEO and co-founder of education technology company Enuma. Uh, we develop uh, early education software to help all children to learn basic literacy and math on their own. Uh, we have popular education app um, called Toto Math and Toto English for well-resourced learners in East Asia. But at the same time, uh, we service to developing countries with our product called Kitkit School and Enuma School. Um, our company actually moved forward to AI education to raise efficiency of education around all children in the world. And Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Ritter, I'm a founder and chief scientist at Carnegie Learning. Uh, we're a curriculum provider uh, to schools in the United States. Uh, and so we're uh, probably best known for our Mafia uh, product, which is used uh, for middle and high school mathematics uh, as an intelligent tutoring system. Uh, but we also have uh, programs focused on English language arts, world languages, uh, computer science, uh, and some other subjects. Uh, my background is also in cognitive psychology and at Carnegie Learning, I lead a research group that is focused on understanding uh, what aspects of our products and services are working really well, which are not uh, working as well and how we can improve effectiveness uh, through data, field experimentation, and other methods. Yaro. Hi everyone. My name is Yaro Zuko. I'm a director of product design at Grid Labs. And uh, what we do at Grid Labs, we design and build a lot of products that have to do with AI uh, and education specifically. And my field in operation, my field of operations, uh, product design, research, branding, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. I, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christopher Hahn, and I'm Vice President and Head of SAP App House Asia. Uh, we serve our customers in the Asia Pacific region uh, through various types of co-innovation project, projects that leverage SAP technology. I also teach uh, design innovation at KAIST uh, Business School. Okay, wonderful. Uh, now let's dive in to some questions that have to do with building AI ed products. The first question is, what are the core unique values that an AI ed product ought to have uh, and ought to deliver to its users? 
Ken, would you like to start us off? Sure thing. Uh, I think that uh, the benefits of AI come not just from advanced technology possibilities. They're great and they can do lots of things for us, especially make these systems more adaptive or maybe make them see into the real world. Uh, but what's super critical to success is that they're applied in a smart way, that they build on the science of, of learning. And I think when we think about this question of uh, addressing the needs of the user base, you know, teachers, students, and schools, we have to not only think about those new innovations, but also about what are the felt needs that those uh, potential unit users have. So um, back way back in the 1990s, we were building intelligent tutoring systems for mathematics and starting to work with uh, our public school systems here to see if they could become a part of a high school uh, and junior high algebra geometry math sequence. And we accumulated evidence that showed that the adaptive features of the AI, and there are multiple ways in which the AI can adapt to students at different timescales, they, they really do help make for more efficient learning. And we were able to demonstrate that in experiments. And that's important to the user base. They want you know, better learning, especially administrators at schools. Uh, but we also uh, saw that we needed to address teachers' concerns and desires. And an important part of that for us at the time was teachers often felt like too many of their students didn't get why they were learning algebra. So we were particularly oriented towards building uh, a product that would address that need, that would help students see how algebra is relevant to their futures, to their interests and so forth. Another key thing was, especially at that time, to adopt a new technology, we had to figure out ways to fit it within the existing structures. And so rather than um, making it a supplement, um, at that time it seemed like it was better to think about redesigning the whole textbook as well as the technology. So that product was a combination of uh, a textbook redesign in which we applied the learning science as well as the technology. And that made it much more possible for uh, that combination to be adopted and to be used in, in schools. And, and, the, and it grew and uh, I think we started in schools in the 1992-93 school year. In 1998, we spun off the company that Steve can tell us more about because Steve has been at uh, Carnegie Learning for, for many years since. Nice segue, Steve. Yeah, so uh, yeah, to follow up on that, I was gonna say, uh, I, I, I agree the, of the idea that the technology and the techniques that we're using in AI often fade into the background. They become, it, it, the, seeing that technology is less important than the effects that that technology has on student learning and on the teacher's ability to manage a class of students. And so for me, um, a lot of the focus on the AI is really on responsiveness. So uh, understanding the student as well as possible so that the um, AI can be responsive to the student's needs and ultimately being helpful for the student. Uh, and that, and I mean that both cognitively uh, in helping the student understand the uh, academic content that the student's supposed to learn, but also uh, particularly motivationally um, in helping the student, like Ken was saying, understand, you know, why am I here? Why is the subject important to me? Uh, but also I think particularly uh, instilling in the student um, a desire to learn more. So part of uh, you know, the motivational factor is pointing out to students or helping students understand the place maybe of algebra in the world, like in a job or a career, but also instilling just a kind of internal desire to really advance in this field, to become an expert, to want to learn more. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if we, if we were able to approach that, we'd really have uh, uh, a great advance over current instructional methods. Mm -hmm. Now, Reed is a company that is 
actually making AI ad products. But let's hear from that perspective, Yaro. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I would echo what um, Steve and Ken said, uh, but also wanted to just add the uh, how important the personalized approach to learning, uh, especially important in the time when, you know, our daily lives are so oversaturated by information and data and um, such powerful technology as artificial intelligence can really help people filter through and prioritize, which most importantly prioritize information that they need to consume and digest in the right process, in the right way, uh, which will be, you know, more like more efficient to them because like we're all um, like, especially coming, like, especially when it comes to students and teachers, we're all different people and we all perceive information differently. Um, and um, processing the way how it needs to be perceived by an individual on an individualistic level, I think is critically important. And that's where AI, I think, could be very helpful. Mm. So it sounds like all of you guys are uh, mentioning how the technology behind AI uh, needs to really serve the user and in some ways be hidden in the background um, as it serves the user. Well, uh, this gets to the, the next question about um, what are some things that product design teams ought to consider when they deliver such value to the users? In other words, how do you do it? Uh, uh, I'll jump in there. Um, so I think there are two major considerations that often um, get left behind when we come up with a brilliant idea for how a technology is going to help educators or help students, uh, you know, improve their lives. And yet they really have an incredible impact on the success of that product. And the first one is the technical infrastructure that's in place in order for a learner to actually engage with a new AI and ed product. And so I think the, particularly in the US, but I think all over the world, um, this has become incredibly apparent as a very important factor of the delivery of an AI and ed product uh, over the course of this past year with the COVID pandemic. As we've seen that uh, many learners don't have access to many of the things that we thought were essential for learning with technology, Wi-Fi access, um, a laptop or something to learn with, oftentimes even telephone service being consistent and allowing learners to engage. And, you know, this is happening at learners' homes, but also there are many schools in a position as well where they don't maybe have the infrastructure on the ground that they do have on paper. And so we put a lot of thought into what are the actual components of our products what is essential and, and what is uh, extraneous and uh, of, around this idea of the technical infrastructure. And we are always looking for ways to make those things simpler for, for users such that they have that consistent access and it affords them an opportunity to learn. The second uh, major factor from my point of view, beyond thinking about the technical infrastructure in a school or a home where someone is learning, is the human infrastructure. We know that learning doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, there are parents, there are siblings, there are teachers. Our teachers are an essential part of the learning process. Tutors, uh, peers, all sorts of other people who are involved in that learning process. And uh, too often we think about just the individual and, and how that product is going to affect them. When in fact, we, there are so many other sources of support, scaffolding, motivation, uh, learning uh, that are available in the environment. And our AI and ed systems could actually take advantage of all of those other other uh, actors who are part of that learning environment. So whether it's, um, you know, supporting your learner in asking a peer or uh, guiding the teacher to someone who needs more help, all of this is an excellent way 
to actually um, multiply the impact of any AI and ed system that you would deploy. So I encourage people to think about what that technical infrastructure is, but also the human infrastructure around the learner. Uh, that's a great point, um, Amy. And when we think of AI ed, we often think of a, a learner in isolation, interacting with some kind of a computer or a robot. But you're pointing out that we ought to be considering using this technology to enhance the interactions with others, including teachers and peers. Um, do you have an example that you would like to share of how that can be best done? Uh, yeah, so we have uh, in one of my um, projects with some wonderful collaborators in the Cote d'Ivoire, we have a system that's deployed on a basic phone for learners to um, learn uh, how to read in French, uh, which is not their first language, but a language that is common to many of the people in the country. And so we were building this system and thinking about what exactly a learner needs, how can you deliver an adaptive curriculum that helps them gain these skills. Uh, and then we recognized how deeply the parents wanted to be involved in this learning process. And before we actually deployed this system to the learners, we built a second system that engaged directly with the parents and it helped them understand where their, their uh, child was in the curriculum, what the goal of the curriculum was and why their child might be engaging with it, how these children could learn in this way. And we found that actually this was incredibly helpful for increasing even compliance with using the system. The parents got more engaged in helping their child uh, call in on a regular basis and, and get these lessons. Uh, but also um, it increased the amount of literacy talk happening in the home. So there was more conversation around literacy because the parents were involved very closely in learning what, you know, where their learner was at their child and uh, what they were doing. So we found this was very successful. Mm. Wow, that's a great example really highlighting that learning is a social experience. Uh, let's hear some other perspectives. Uh, maybe first going to those who are from industry. Um, Su Suyin, yeah. what is your thought to this question? So I'm just echoing Amy's point on delivery and access to technical infrastructure and understanding children's environment. Uh, I just want to emphasize the importance of human-centered design. Uh, the importance of field research to understand the situation of the users. So what we learned for na last nine years is many of us developers in wealthy countries, in air conditioning room, uh, raising our smart children in very good environment, often make critical mistake by assuming that all children in the world may similar to our own children. So um, we deliver products to uh, families in, in wealthy East Asian uh, countries, but at the same time, we deliver our product to developing countries uh, where the community doesn't have enough infrastructure. So the value of device, culture, desire to education is very different as Amy emphasized. Um, but sometimes um, there are more factors that is almost impossible to understand without close observation of learners. I will give you two examples. We found uh, in Tanzanian field research, we found that young children who are in five and, fifth, uh, five and six years old spent most of time watching videos and barely play the game, play learning games. So we spent some time to just tune the game's difficult levels and edit the in instructions for help those learners. But one day, one Tanzanian staff just told that children in Tanzanian rural area usually taught not to touch any valuable thing. So they just afraid to touch the, the screen. So after that, we added just a simple instruction that adult figure just came in to the screen and tell them, hey, this is a called tablet device. It's totally fine for you to touch. And it doesn't remove all those children's fear about touching strange device, but it was definitely helpful. Uh, also in some culture, some girls, especially girls, um, 
trained not to speak loudly in public place. So their voice are really small and it's really hard to collect their voice. So voice recognition uh, is almost impossible because this child never read aloud in front of other people. So without understanding that culture part, without observing with a field expert, um, we couldn't understand what is going on and may, just, uh, may this misunderstanding drive us to just wasting our time for meaningless solutions. So we believe that just going there and observing them and try to understand how children are different from one culture to another culture, from one socioeconomic background to another socioeconomic background. Um, yeah, that, that's what I, I, I learned and we are still learning. Mm, thank you for that insight. Uh, let's, let's continue with the industry perspective for the moment. Yaro? Uh, yeah, I'm hoping to bring more um, Enfield perspective and um, kind of, you know, like bring the value of how we build products at Red Labs and explain some of the uh, approaches that we take. And uh, we always take, we always um, revolve our product building process around a user. And um, as important as it is to take into account all of the actors and social aspect into uh, the product building and like the member acquisition and member uh, retention and all of those um, things, uh, we, you know, when we start building a product, it's always about the the person who will be using it, including, of course, um, how, like what this person needs. And, um, you know, if we think about building a product, when like we think of the components to it, like uh, there's technical perspective, there's user perspective, and there's business objectives and needs. And all of those things need to be balanced and um, uh, coordinated in the right way. So uh, we, follow the de design thinking approach. And we like, as simple as it is, we start by speaking to people and understanding what they actually need, what their frustrations are, uh, what their motivations are to use this product. Um, and um, yeah, so that's basically um, kind of how we approach this. And I, I could go into more technicalities if needs be, uh, if need be, um, so. Yeah, let me know if that'd be helpful. Okay, yeah. Once again, emphasizing the importance of uh, being very user-centered as a starting yeah. point for product development. Uh, Let's yeah, circle back to the academic perspective. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, what I think is super interesting now is that the you know user-centered research has really made its way into industry and, and those kind of field-based as Yin was talking about uh, and, and Yara were, uh, were talking about that kind of qualitative research is super important, super powerful. At the same time, as, as more technologies are getting into use, we're collecting vast amounts of data from these systems and doing quantitative analyses, applying machine learning to this kind of data is a super big opportunity at the same time. And the two together are, are very powerful. Um, back in 2004, uh, um, we had an opportunity from our National Science Foundation to create a, a, a learning science center that was really about creating a technical infrastructure to be able to both, uh, you know, collect this kind of data from educational technologies in math and science and language learning, but also build out uh, a way of doing experiments where we would go to the learning science literature and, you know, there's, there's so much there. It, it's really rich and complex, right? There there are at least 30 different dimensions of choice in that, in that literature and lots of experiments that have been done. But, you know, and we thought, well, we're gonna bring those ideas into existing courses through technologies. But one of our major discoveries was you can't just pull these ideas off the shelf. Uh, learning science has a lot of great ideas, but there really needs to be an iterative engineering process that adapts those ideas, that uses the qualitative and the quantitative data to make them work in your particular context. <clears throat> and we de develop lots of tools. We have a, a huge data repository. There's some 3,000 educational technology 
data sets in our data, sh data shop data repository, and then a whole bunch of tools for using that kind of data to essentially optimize the various forms of adaptation and personalization that are possible. And, and we've seen um, at least three different uh, timescales at which you can do this kind of adaptation and continuous improvement of courses and for multiple different dimensions from the more cognitive, the more uh, thinking oriented to the more social and, and emotional forms of adaptation. So I think, you know, that goes back to Amy's point about technical infrastructure, you know, not only in regions, but in, in a broader sense so that we can make this university industry bridge in a really powerful way, right? If we're sharing data across universities and industries in ways that we can learn more about how learning works at the same time, we're having impact in education. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you talk about impact, I guess that gets to the question of how do we measure learning outcomes? So let's turn to that question. How do we measure learning outcomes in AI ed solutions? And how do we do it in a way that contributes to product improvements that are both cost-effective and sustainable? Uh, to start us off, uh, uh, why don't we, Ken, would you like to just continue and, and share your thought on that? Yeah, well, um, certainly uh, there is uh, the kinds of core achievement in, in math and science and language that we care about. And, you know, um, there's definitely issues in making assessments uh, be better, but I think one of the things we, you know, we do need to attend to uh, do these products make, when they're applied in those fundamental areas, do they help kids read, you know, effectively and efficiently more so than, than alternatives or learn math or learn science. So, uh, you know, using those kinds of standard-based assessments are important, but, you know, one of the things that I think we get caught up in too much is relying just on one measure. Those are important, but that's not the only measure. And often innovations are in changing the content, um, thinking of new things. Like we're starting to teach statistics in middle school like we never did before. And if you stuck with the old assessments, you wouldn't be uh, assessing that. Um, so it's important to to, you know, when, when we're looking at these kinds of studies, and I think ultimately doing a random assignment field experiment is the most rigorous and valued kind of thing, we, we should be looking at multiple outcome measures. Another one that's super important is, you know, we, we, we've developed these high school algebra courses, and, you know, we've shown that in big randomized trials that students learn more. But the other thing we, you know, might even care more about is do they go on to the next course, right? I think I'd rather have students continuing in the math sequence and maybe not learning as much um, as a student who's learned more, but doesn't wanna take the next course. So looking at uh, engagement is, uh, and, and future uh, engagement in learning, I think is a super important outcome. Kind of hard to measure because you have to track students over a long term. So that's where the kind of university industry collaboration can help, but uh, yeah core content, new innovative content, sort of motivation and engagement, all of those are important measures. Mm. Wow. I wish I had learned statistics and probabilities when I was in middle school. I wouldn't have suffered so much in grad school. Yeah. Uh, let's turn to Steve. What's your perspective? Sure. Uh, I, I totally agree with the, uh... Uh, focus on the content of the outcomes, but I think just as important is thinking about the distribution of those outcomes across students, particularly with AI systems. Uh, you know, we're used to kind of um, treating the middle kind of 80% of students, right, and providing effective instruction for those students and hoping that, you know, the more advanced students or maybe the more uh, students at the lower end who need remediation will, you know, figure out ways to catch up. And one of the promises of AI in education and in general personalization of education is really to think about addressing students across the entire range, right? And, uh, and helping every, you know, 100% of the students rather than 
uh, focusing on the middle 80%. Mm. Well, one of the benefits of AI is supposed to be customization right, to the user. So yeah, that's a great point yeah. to be able to address all 100%. Uh, let's hear some additional perspectives. Um, Suin? Mm. So um, we collect everything uh, in games perspective on engagement and retention. Uh, but at the same time, we collect uh, all the learning outcome, the data, anything that can explain the learning outcome. We are selling our products to school and uh, parents. So uh, demonstrating learning outcome is very important. So when we are working with schools, uh, we also run the benchmark test uh, from the outside field, uh, choose from the standard format that is important by the stakeholders. But at the same time, we are testing many different type of assessment to understand the children's characteristics and learning um, readiness. So our children, our target users are four to nine years old. So their brain are not still very well standardized. And it's hard to understand our users just based on their, based on their age or uh, gender or uh, school grade. So we measure children's short-term memory, strategic thinking, reaction time, and so on um, to understand just to understand a bit more about the children's situation and how each characteristic of children will impact to the learning outcome. So our ultimate goal is understand uh, learners' persona behind different play patterns to provide more engaging experience for users. Sometimes it's not just about learning, but more about feeling and, and their motivation. Mm -hmm. Yaro, your thoughts? Um, yeah, thank you, Christopher. I think when it comes to measuring you know, score versus retention mastery or uh, member acquisition metrics, it all, all kind of um, falls under the umbrellas of aforementioned uh, user needs versus business objectives when a company that provides um, AI services uh, needs to kind of operate, right? To keep providing the services, to keep improving people's lives, to keep uh, helping people learn. Um, like in that case, it would be what's, what's valuable to measure our um, retention and member acquisition. Like for example, those metrics, right? Like when it comes to the user needs, it's helpful to measure a score or mastery level. Um, so, and it like, the, it all based on the stage of the company development and the stage of the product development in particular. Um, so it like, it's not like we kind of just need to measure one thing and, um, you know, kind of be happy with it. Like it's, it's a continuous process that we need to uh, build upon. And when it comes to measuring, when it comes to actual activities of measuring, of taking, collecting the data, uh, what comes to my mind is um, techniques like A-B testing, for example. And while certain metrics are easier to, uh, to collect in terms of data, others would be easier to get using patterns, like for example, um, revenue patterns or like what people are ready to engage with, like what people, like simply what UI element they tap on um, over time. So those patterns are helpful to understand for a longer term and then like use them for again, for metrics like member acquisition or engagement. Mm. Okay. You know, when we're talking about learning outcomes, um, you know, I, I was just thinking as you, as you were all sharing that um, one of the things that the current education system has is um, an attempt to measure one's intelligence and aptitude. I remember taking the scholastic aptitude test as I was a, uh, junior in high school, right? Um, many countries have such examinations. The, the place where I am working right now in Korea has a, a large, uh, an annual uh, examination and presumably it's meant to measure one's intelligence and aptitude and predict one's success. <laughs> um, how might AI change that paradigm and allow for better understanding of each child's, each student's um, 
potential, both intellectually and otherwise. I'm just gonna open this question up. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question, Christopher. Um, and one of the things we were thinking about in that uh, vein is, uh, you know, when you think about these ed tech systems that, you know, students may be using on a regular basis, many hours over a school year compared to a two hour test. You know, when you think about that, which is gonna give you a better idea about that student, 50 hours over a whole year or a couple hours at one point, right? Um, I think there's huge potential there in thinking about the data that comes from these interactive learning systems as creating a much more accurate and rich uh, um, view of not just their aptitude, but their particular skills and their dispositions, their motivational dispositions, maybe even their self-regulatory learning strategies and so forth. So, you know, increasingly we're seeing like in fields like educational data mining, new ways to detect um, is a student uh, engaging in diligent behavior, for example. Are, there, are they good help seekers, these higher level learning kinds of strategies? But also um, there've been studies to look at whether that year long data say in an eighth grade math test, the uh, math uh, practice environment can predict our state tests. And they do so incredibly accurately. In fact, the sort of test retest reliability of the, uh, of the whole course is probably much better than of the individual test. So I think that's a, a, a major future potential for, for AI and education as we see more of these interactive learning by doing environments being uh, you know, used from, from reading you know, in elementary school through college courses. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that in our experience with, uh, with both administrators and school district officials, there's a lot of enthusiasm around changing the way that we do these kind of high stakes assess assessments. You know, there's a lot of recognition about how much stress they cause and how they distort the education system in so many ways where you're teaching towards the test and you're uh, emphasizing, you know, preparing for those three hours instead of kind of preparing for the rest of your life. Um, so I've been really encouraged by, um, by the fact that um, although there's a lot of work to be done to move to this kind of uh, world that Ken was describing uh, for assessment, um, there is a lot of support to do it if we could figure out how to do it. I think AI is really key to that in understanding how students kind of everyday performance in the classroom, what that reflects about their abilities. Um, and like was, Ken was saying, their uh, predispositions and, uh, and metacognitive strategies and other things. Um, I have uh, a bit different perspective about what AI will do for the test. So right now, the world actually teach the same subject in the same speed to all around the world and see massive failure from all different environments. So UNESCO said that 60% of children in the world actually failing to master proficiency level, uh, basic literacy and math skills. And this is a huge problem. And there is a one critical question. Is this the right speed and the curriculum for all those different learners in the world? So the test is actually a major the measure after we deliver certain contents. I believe that if the AI education just become more mature, maybe we can see a uh, very different definition of the curriculum. And we can actually see many different directions how to train the future, um, future employees or the future contributor to the world in a very innovative way that we hadn't ever imagined before. Well, very important. I guess well, spinning off of that a bit, I, you know, one question about why those differences are so big, you know, it goes to, I think not just curriculum, but the kind of opportunity issues that some of you were raising before, right? And, you know, we see things uh, like in data about the so-called summer slide where 
uh, you know, it's clear that a lot of students are getting uh, educational experiences out of the 20, uh, outside of the 20% of the, t of their waking hours they spend in, you know, in school, right? 80% of a kid's waking hours are out of school. And there are huge differences in the learning opportunities available to kids in higher socioeconomic status homes. And, um, and so that learning opportunity gap is, is super uh, big, right? And, and we have to figure out you know, not only improving the curriculum, but how to bridge that learning opportunity gap. How do we help more parents and more homes and more communities, you know, get access to high quality interactive learning opportunities? I also want to just emphasize in here for children have different abilities and characteristics, like children with special needs who require uh, additional help and many children who come from different language community. So some children actually, actually many children in the world um, has a different language at home from the academic language learned in school. So there is a many, many barriers and we can, if the technology evolves, we can reduce all those barriers dramatically by analyzing their struggles and provide an effective solution that fit to those children's situation. So I believe that um, definitely um, AI education can be dramatically um, influenced to current education system, but at the same time, it actually gave us opportunity to think about totally different education system for children who can't do well in current education system. One of the new ways that uh, paradigms that uh, we are looking at approaching those challenges is through the idea of stealth assessment. That is uh, removing the pressure of these exams, uh, removing some of the um, barriers that there are for learners to move from one education uh, system to the next uh, by doing these assessments that we've been talking about in a um, it, it, behind the scenes in the technology itself. And so uh, I really like this term of stealth assessment where we're thinking about um, exposing the learner only to those learning opportunities rather than making everything that they do about you know, studying for a test. And so uh, one example of that is you might actually build a game uh, that um, teaches the particular content that you would like to teach but we make sure to build into that game a number of opportunities for learners to demonstrate their skills and their knowledge. And we use the data and information gleaned from how they dealt with the challenges in the game in order to do multiple things. One is to get a better understanding of, of their abilities, but secondly, also maybe to adapt the technology in ways that make that experience uh, better for those students. And so this could particularly be used for those students, as Soon was mentioning, who have a differing level of uh, language ability or of some other um, background that they bring into the learning opportunity, and we can better tailor to those particular students. So I think that's a really fun way to actually um, get learners excited and active in the learning environment and remove uh, many of those barriers that uh, test taking places in front of them. You know, one, one example that kind of gets that Yara was talking about A-B testing, you know, another big opportunity is there's sometimes natural variation in these data sets. Like we, we did this analysis of a, of a MOOC. It was for introductory psychology. Um, but what we saw is there was a huge variation in how students use different resources. Did they watch the lectures? How much did they watch the lectures? How much did they read the online pages? How much did they do the interactive learning by doing formative assessments? The first thing we found is that, you know, and, and this is a regular discovery we see, sometimes there's adaptations you can do that work pretty well for everybody. But, you know, 
the biggest impact on outcomes in this course were students who did more of the formative assessments. That was a six times bigger impact on the final exams than watching more lectures or reading more pages, six times bigger, huge effect. Learning by doing, you know, practice makes perfect kind of thing. Like sometimes we lose track of that, I think, because it's so, it's, it's more of an implicit learning that happens through practice, but it, it's the way our brains work, it's so important. But the other thing, and, and this actually work that a student with Amy and I did, um, you know, goes back to your point about different student backgrounds. We saw in MOOCs that students who were not first language English speakers were much more likely to do the readings than watch the lectures. And they benefited more from readings that they could process at their own pace, as opposed to the lectures, which were harder for them to process in their second language. So it's so yet another example of how this data has sort of secrets hidden in it that we can discover and then learn how to adapt these courses and improve our products by making those discoveries. Wow. Great insights from both academia and industry. You know, one of the promises of technology, I suppose in any domain, is this ability to change the paradigm. And we talked about here, among other things, how students today in many educational systems are assessed and their futures are in large part determined by the outcome of a single three hour test. I, I like what Steve mentioned, um, you know, what's more important in determining a child's future? Is it a three hour test or a lifetime of learning? Uh, or do we want to um, focus on teaching for the test for those three hours or for a lifetime? Yeah. Having lived in Korea for the last seven plus years, and I, I grew up in the US, but I've lived here for the last seven plus years, I've got very well acquainted with the education system here. I think if, if AI technology can change the education system here, in particular, how assessment is done, you can improve the lives of an entire society <laughs> and perhaps an entire generation of young people globally. Um, so this is a, a very exciting prospect. Um, okay, now I wanna change the, uh, um, the focus here a little bit. Um, you know, in, in many cases, learning comes down to engagement and attention, which have been, become even more important in an online learning environment. How can we measure and maintain learner engagement in AI ed products? Um, maybe, shall we start with Steve? Sure. Uh I think one of the things that's most complex about, uh, it's complex about everything in education when we're talking about personalization, but motivation in particular is so sensitive to the individual student's uh, context and background and experience. Um, so one thing, you know, we, we look a lot at games, for example, everybody points to games because students are very engaged with the games. Uh, but one of the things that we need to think about in applying the lessons from games to educational software is the context that the student's in. And I think the way that we might apply it in software that's used in schools or in instructional environments that are in schools versus instructional environments that are purely choice environments but for entertainment um, is very different. So one of the things about games is, you know, my, when my kids get really engaged in the game, part of the reason they're engaged in it is they chose to play that game and they chose not to play some other games. They'll stop playing, you know, they don't love every game that they try and it's fine to stop it and move on to something else. That's a very different situation than we find in schools. And so thinking about ways that we can give students choices and agency in their education, particularly in that school environment, I think is really key to, to getting students uh, engaged in doing what they're doing. Mm. Some gamification in learning. Yeah, yeah, it's gamification, but it's careful gamification, right? It's not, it's not true that something that works in a video game that kids play after school 
will also work in an educational environment where, you know, if, if you uh, took a group of students and told them that they need to play Fortnite, you know, for an hour a day for the next month, you would, they would rebel. <laughs> Some of them would, right? <laughs> you know, uh, so the context is always just really important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's, let's hear from Amy. Yes, yeah, so I, I really like Steve's point here. And one of my favorite studies that looked at this idea of choice and autonomy was by a researcher named Jacob Habgood, who looked at two different versions of uh, an educational experience. One where um, there was a fun game and then interspersed were a set of math activities. So you'd play the game and then do the math and then play the game and then do the math. And the second version was really well integrated. So the math was an integral part of the game, but the game was still the same fun game that students like to play. And he compared these two versions to see which one would students choose to play for longer, bringing up this issue of autonomy that, that Steve mentioned. And it turned out uh, they played the game that was integrated, the math and the um, game play for almost twice as long as they wanted to engage in the other experience. And he had lots of great interviews with students afterwards where they talked about how much more fun it was to play this game uh, that involved the same difficult math, but made it part of this fun challenge compared to, um, you know, the separate bit where it felt like you were drudging, you were required to get through the math in order to get to this fun experience afterwards. And so there's a whole lot of lessons that we can take away from the learning science literature like this on how to make those choices in our educational environments uh, in ways that will increase students' engagement and attention. I think another really easy one is to make your, if you have an instructional video or some other sort of material, make it short, make it about one topic, let them choose to watch that one and then move on and do something else. Uh, you know, people lose that sense of, of engagement very quickly when it's something that they're required to do and they know they have to sit down and, and watch this thing for a long time. So there's lots of great studies on how we can do this. Um, but I also wanted to quickly bring up the idea that it's not just uh, engagement and attention that we want to be looking for, but we can also look at all sorts of other uh, emotional experiences that learners have along the way. And some of the most important have turned out to be confusion and frustration and looking at how those manifest as well, because if, you're, if a student gets to a point where they're confused, and they resolve that confusion, that's great. Then they're even more engaged. But if they're confused, no one helps them. The technology doesn't help them get past that problem. They get frustrated and then disengaged. And so managing all of those emotions around learning is just as important as thinking about that, that pure engagement as well. Mm. Amy, just a quick follow-up to your last comment about the emotions that are being experienced by the learner. When that person is in a classroom context with a very attentive teacher, he or she can notice the student's feelings. But if, that, if the student is uh, in an isolated context interacting with a computer, how can AI technology sense those emotions? Yeah, that's a great question. And teachers are really good at this. So that's something that in the classroom, we rely on them to say, oh my gosh, this student is looking confused or half the class is looking confused and I better stop and, and you know explain this or come over to this student, right? So what happens when a student is alone? Well, there's been a whole lot of progress on the artificial intelligence side of actually detecting these things in learners' behavior. And so two of the ways we can do that is through uh, actually looking at the actions that they choose. So 
For example, clicking repeatedly on something that is not making any progress is oftentimes a sign of frustration along with a number of other behavioral signals. Um, but we can also utilize things like cameras and start to take a look at people's facial expressions. And we're, we're usually quite expressive about these sorts of things when we don't know what's going on. So there are some really nice models out there of emotional states and they're able to be applied to these educational contexts. Of course, I should mention, as Sue was telling us so importantly before, that different students also express things in different ways. And so we're constantly working on making those models more inclusive. So what do different students look like to bring different backgrounds into the environment? Because, of course, not every student looks exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Just as a, a side note, uh, in my own doctoral research, uh, I did some emotion coding as part of my research and found it very fascinating that um, uh, micro expressions mm -hmm. uh, are universal, um, whereas some vocal qualities that express emotions or affect uh, may be culturally embedded. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the, if the AI can learn from both video and uh, audio data about the students' emotions, then perhaps that can be a, a trigger for how it interacts with the learner. Um, <laughs> very fascinating. Uh, let's transition right over to Ken. Your, your thoughts on this question? Yeah, well, what, one of this, um, I'm going to do two sides of the teacher role because I think, you know, when you say that the teacher can see it, it's not always clear in a big class that the teacher's really seeing everything that's going on. And, and um, we had a a PhD thesis recently where that explored what if the teacher had instant access to the data from the say the 30 students in their math class working on a mathy a product like like uh, uh, um, Carnegie Learnings that Steve Ritter has. Um, and what if it's in Google Glass so they can walk around hands free. And what he was able to show is with that data, they were much more likely to give help to struggling students. And that intervention sort of, you know, if you think about, you know, students who start further behind tend to stay further behind, right? Everybody advances somewhat. But what he showed is that this really helped the students on the low end because the teacher was giving more attention to those students because the teacher was, had that data access, right? They could see who was struggling, who was like doing this clicking through behavior that Amy was talking about, right? Or who's doing nothing at all, or who's got their virtual hand raised and go right to that student. And, you know, I don't know, we probably won't have teachers with Google glasses in our classrooms tomorrow, but it's an interesting feature. But I think it also shows that there is real power to add on to what the teacher can do. So the second part of this is the, the sort of the flip side is which, which is, you know, our technologies, even if they discover that a student is frustrated, they're not always so good uh, at, at remediating that. And especially if there's a deeper root cause. And we know from the vast social psychology literature that there's many ways that students can be unmotivated. They might not have a growth mindset. They might not uh, have a sense of utility for the, that, of the, for the mathematics. They might not feel like they belong. Um, uh, they might have stereotype threat uh, because of uh, 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 um, various stereotypes that they might self-impose. And all this is in the literature, but I think what we could be doing with our AI is helping teach teachers and human mentors who are good at addressing those issues to figure out which kids to go help. Um, and then they can use the unique skills that they have to address those deeper motivational issues that students might be having. Excellent perspective. Uh, Suyin, what about you? Um, yeah, uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much for all the sharing from other panelists. I was a game designer and our many of our team members are from game industry. So I just want to share a bit about how to integrate learning and games in our team. Um, so, from our experience, the sequence of uh, learning games are very different from the pure game product uh, because pure game product uh, create higher level of fun 
by deeper immersing experience. But in learning, we actually couldn't make that deep level of immersive experience. So we just break some of the function of the games and apply it on limited way. So we use three different ways of fun in when we are building our system. First is short-term fun um, that is from well-designed interaction. So touch screen device is perfect because it's so easy to create feeling of fun by just managing the sound and, and animation of the touch. So that, and, and that actually encouraged our team to build a education product um, after seeing the iPad, potential of iPad and all those touch screen devices. So that is a short term fun. And we can actually create just a fun of basic problem solving by just manipulating the sound and animation so easily. And the second is a midterm, for a midterm fun, we call it midterm. It comes from the feeling of stacking value in, uh, with in-game assets. So money, coins, uh, stars, uh, badges, and those type of things are usually, um, usually discussed as gamification. So it is very uh, capitalized concept. Um, so just stacking something and became bitch inside of the game. And we call third one as long-term um, fun, long-term engagement. And I think that that is very important when we use game into education. Uh, this come from the demonstration of their achievement to their environment, their real-time environment. So they can feel proudness and achievement if, if this child sends friends envy or parents' attention, or teachers' recognition by uh, improving or, or attacking certain level and prove them how good they are inside of the game. And most, I believe that all children actually uh, can be successful in their own way and just giving, the, giving something to celebrate together with their life is actually the strongest motivation for those children. So I believe that there are still many things that uh, traditional game industry can share with academia. And we, just, uh, and we just apply our knowledge on game into that way. But there can be so many different ways how to apply um, the benefit of game into education. Mm. Wow, this is fascinating. I think we can speak for hours on these topics <laughs> uh, because we have uh, among our panelists, both uh, uh, members from academia as well as industry. My next question has to do with how might we best bring together theoretical research from academia uh, and apply perspectives from industry to deliver the most impactful AI ed products. Uh, let me turn to Steve. Sure. Um, we've uh, we've done a number of uh, research projects in cooperation with uh, with university researchers, and I think um, uh, fundamentally it's an acknowledgement that um, there are a lot of ideas um, that come out of academia, fundamental research uh, findings that can be applied, um, and what industry allows. Uh, particularly is scale. And that's particularly, you know, we've been talking a lot about personalization and addressing every student um, and also the uh, value of context or the importance of context. Um, and so um, what industry can do is provide kind of scale, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students, perhaps, um, along with the uh, um, relevant uh, and genuine context of a classroom or a student uh, or child working at home, um, that's much harder for uh, academics to, um, to address. Hmm. And, and from academia, Amy? I think this is a really great statement from Steve. 
Uh, and I think that is something uh, the scale is something that absolutely we're not um, attuned to in academia that can really be supported when you have those industry partners. So that's really critical. I think the other trend that we're moving towards is something that we've been really discussing this whole panel um, in academia, which is the idea of translational research. So making sure that we are not just doing very basic science, which is also really important just to understand the foundations of cognition and memory and attention, but also really paying attention to the challenges and opportunities that are out there in that real world of teaching and learning. Uh, and so if we can conduct this research in a way that we call translational, that is moving from academia to the real world, um, that's something that lets our research be picked up more easily by industry and used immediately, rather than having to put the energy and effort into thinking about, okay, here's this finding, how might we implement it in our product? And one of the things that really facilitates this is those partnerships that Steve was mentioning. So working together um, to make sure, again, the challenges that we're working on are real, uh, and then that there's an uh, a opportunity for them to be taken up through an industry partner is something that I find very exciting. Yeah, exciting indeed. I mean, we were talking about so many impactful ideas that could really make a difference to uh, so many, so many people across the world. Um, really looking forward to uh, even more synergistic uh, collaboration between academia and, 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 and industry. Okay, I, I'd like to now uh, pose a final question. And this is more about imagining the, the future and what might be. Uh, what new innovations uh, might we expect that could potentially uh, go into an AI product of the AI ed, ed product of the future? What are some innovations that, that you see in the horizon? And Amy, how about we start with you? Uh, there are so many possibilities for what could be coming up next. So I'll just jump to something that's, I think, maybe far in the future, but that I think is really exciting and different, uh, which is something we're, we're thinking about in our lab that uses virtual reality. And I'm very excited about this because one of the things that I think virtual reality is really great at, it's not good at at many things, <laughs> there's, there's some things that just don't make sense in VR. But one thing that we know from research it can really do is help you take on other people's perspectives. And so we've been talking a lot about educational equity this uh, hour. And one thing that's really hard to do uh, in that pursuit of equity is to put yourself in someone's shoes and see what they really experience. And so there's been a lot of cool research, not in education, but just in, in this perspective taking literature on how in putting on a VR helmet and seeing yourself in someone else's shoes can really change the way you think and the way you in fact behave later on. And so this is something I think is really cool, which has uh, exciting applications in education for getting people to actually engage in that behavior change. And that could be everyone from the students, getting them to think from other people's perspective in the class, but even also the teachers and helping them think about the perspective of a student with a disability or that student sitting in the back of the class who doesn't get any attention. And using a future technology like this has a lot of advantages uh, that really deeply impacts the way that you see the world. So that's something I'm excited about. Mm. Okay. Ken? Uh, well, two things. Uh, one is uh, related to what Amy was saying, a more general category of mixed reality. And, and I know that Amy's doing some work related to this, where using sensing technologies in the classroom to observe like student reactions to 
particular teaching moves and 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 build you know both the data but the opportunity to to uh, uh, react to those things. But another instance of that, you know, one way to think about that is we've had these intelligent tutoring systems in the flat screen for a long time now, and we have games in the flat screen. But can we get the AI so that kids can be learning out in the physical world, but still getting that kind of personalized adaptation? So one of my uh, junior colleagues, Nessera Yanir, has created these, what she calls an intelligent science stations, where there's a scientific apparatus, for example, in a shaking simulated earthquake table, and kids are running experiments on that table, like taking two towers and predicting which one's going to fall first, and then you know, using properties of, of physics like center of mass to explain why one tower fell. And there's a, a con connect camera watching what's going on so that the AI agent, which appears on the screen as this gorilla that's giving the kids feedback can say, you know, uh oh, your prediction wasn't right. Um, how come that tower fell? And then engage them in a dialogue to probe the science. And then it prompts them to build towers on their own. It can also observe you know, whether the towers they've built are working. And, and she's starting to show that we can have these kinds of intelligent science stations for a whole variety of different kinds of apparatuses. There's another one involving uh, ramps where kids are exploring properties of, of, of potential and kinetic energy going down ramps. There's a balance scale environment. So that idea that intelligent tutors can get out into the 3D world, I think super powerful and be super interesting especially as we're getting back to face-to-face. -to -face. The second one that I'm really excited about is the potential to uh, use machine learning in ways that are gonna allow us to do more efficient transfer of expertise. And the vision here is as we're starting to build machine learning systems that can kind of learn like students do, we're, we're beginning to see the possibility that instead of doing a lot of programming to create a, an intelligent tutor for a new domain, you can simply have the expert tutor the computer and then the tutor can uh, tutor many, you know, thousands, millions of students. Um, and that, uh, that, you know, that's, there are some demonstrations of that now, but uh, it's not quite ready yet, but it's getting close. And I think that will allow us to really accelerate this uh, you know, AI ability to do that kind of adaptation for, for new domains, for any do domain, right? We can be teaching uh, machine learning itself, for example, better by, uh, by having experts in, in machine learning uh, tutor the computer on how to do those kinds of activities and then build tutors that, that, uh, that go out. What's also cool about that is we're kind of building computational models of how learning works in a way that advances the science at the same time. And, that's, that's super exciting too. Well, let's hear now from industry. Uh, no, I'm just echoing what Amy and Ken just uh, said. Uh, we, I'm, I believe that we are, our site in, uh, in industry is not that far. So for example, because we are generating mobile apps, we just try to do the best with our current limitation and uh, medium. But we are really, really looking forward a better system, better recognition system, and more, uh, more adaptive content, uh, let's say flexible contents that can be changed with, uh, with uh, many different feedbacks. So right now the environment and the game contents are really, really hard to manipulate. So those type of technology will be definitely very helpful. And uh, some of the dream of more, um, more adaptive human interaction within that mobile uh, device that feels like real, but totally adaptive to each user's responses. That's something we are looking forward to have in near future. Okay. How about Steve? Uh, I think we've alluded to this a, a, a lot uh, throughout um, all the discussion today, uh, but it's important to emphasize, I think, um, how AI is changing uh, both the instruction for students, but also the educational environment around that instruction.
construction. So for example, um, thinking about uh, like Ken and Amy and others were talking about how the AI can help inform the teacher, for example. Um, and so that's a way of thinking about the role of the AI, not just as providing better instruction directly to the student, but as informing a better whole uh, educational ecosystem that includes teachers, uh, peers, um, administrators, other people in the educational parents. environment around the student, parents. Yeah, parents, right? <laughs> okay, and how about you, Yaro? Uh, yeah, well, really, well, not to echo uh, what other panelists had said before, but uh, um, also wanted to add the voice recognition that I think is a very important part of uh, expanding on the AI possibilities in the future. Um, I can only imagine if, you know, everything was just under my voice control and like also adding um, the aspect of different languages and people speaking different languages and AI learning different accents, AI learning the way, like even different slangs or like, you know, catering to certain specifications of an individual. Um, when it comes to voice control and voice recognition. So that's also, I think, something that is very interesting. Mm, yes, conversational AI. And you bring up an interesting point about accents. Um, yeah, people who study linguistics and friends have told me that actually everyone has an accent. So then if you're going to standardize on this product, which accent do you choose? <laughs> it's a very interesting question. Okay. Well, uh, just for, for, for me, just to add a very brief comment, um, uh, you know, I, I, I worked in industry for 25 years, most of which was in Silicon Valley. And one of the things I observed was the, the power of technology uh, to really change the economics of a domain. And I'm hoping and looking forward to uh, the technology of artificial intelligence really changing the economics of education in such a way brings far more high quality education experiences to, to everyone, those who are in the margins of society, certainly, um, and really change the life experience of, of, of learners you know, throughout the world. Because there's so many uh, bad experiences, I think, that can be changed dramatically through, through technology. And, and that's certainly a hope that I have. Well, here, uh, our, our time has, has well, wow, just can't believe how an hour just uh, has gone by so quickly. Um, uh, let me just share a few uh, thoughts to wrap up here. Um, one is, you know, we had a wonderful uh, group of panelists here, the five of you representing both uh, academia and industry. And it really shows that uh, theory and practice uh, they do draw on one another. I think you've demonstrated that with your insights. Um, and uh, we answered lots of very interesting questions today. And, and I certainly learned so much from all of you. Um, but from, the, from this past hour, I, I, I think what you shared really um, generates even more questions and really highlights the the, the, the true complexity of this topic um, and, and how we can look at it from so many different perspectives. And I, I do hope that we can have another setting like this to come back together and to be able to tackle together uh, some of these questions, some of these newer questions um, after you've done more research and after you've developed more products um, in the future. Okay, well, I would like to thank our wonderful panelists here today. And I, I want to highlight them once again by name, um, Amy Ogan, uh, who is the Thomas and Lydia Moran Professor of Learning, Learning Science at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Ken Katinger, um, also at Carnegie Mellon University. He is the Hillman Professor of Computer Science. And we have Suin Lee of Enuma, she is CEO and creative lead. And we have Steve Ritter uh, from Carnegie Learning. He is the founder and chief scientist. Um, and lastly, we have Yaro uh, Zubko, 
of Reed Labs. He is the Director of Product Design. And I, uh, Christopher Hahn, on behalf of uh, all of us here today, would like to thank you, the audience, for joining us and wishing you the very best. Goodbye. <laughs>